We've talked a lot in this module about network visibility, and that can come from many different sources, endpoint or the network itself, and other data sources we're going to talk about here in this lecture. But we have to have a place where we can collect and collate this information, make it available to us that are doing the security so that we could respond to alerts. There's two sides of the coin here. We have our preventative tools that alert us to things. They help point us towards hotspots in the network of potentially anomalous or malicious activity. And it is our job to respond to those events. And the way we measure how successful we are are based on how fast we detect after the event occurred and how long it takes us to investigate. And then again, how much longer does it take us to close that case or investigation? So organizations are constantly monitoring these metrics to see how well we're doing as a security operations team. To be able to do all of that, we need all of that network visibility, those flow logs, the endpoint EDR logs, the antivirus alerts. We need all of that stuff in a singular framework that allows us to do that analysis. Traditionally, and this is still true in many organizations, that they have multiple tools. I spoke to one gentleman who worked in a SOC, and they had 18 distinct tools that they used during an investigation, a common investigation would use up to 18 distinct tools and as you'd imagine it took them many hours to go through a simple investigation because there was just so much to do every tool was different everyone used a different query syntax they named fields slightly different and the problem was if you extracted data from one system and tried to corroborate it or compare with data in another the field names didn't match so there's a lot going on with just usability and accessibility from just security tools. The more tools you have does not mean your security team is better. And a recent study came out, they said organizations with fewer tools and appropriately trained staff that had defined procedures were way more effective than another tool who spent way more money on the best and breed tools, but had more of them. There's a reliance on tools that we need to balance, right? We can buy the best tools because they do a lot of work for us, but we have to know how to wield those tools effectively. And the first step in doing that is, again, understanding our network, our use cases, but having a place to analyze that data. And this refers to logging in our network. Almost every single system, network node, passive analysis capability, threat intelligence, external service we might use, the cloud, a vendor product, whatever it is, they all in some way, shape or form generate logs or data about what it observed. Authentication events, file access, network communications, process execution, registry access, you name it, if there's a log in the network that has it. So the hard challenge we've got to deal with is how do we get all of these logs and then format the logs so that they work cohesively for us so that we can pivot, you know, right? Do that multidimensional analysis between these data sets. If every data set is completely distinct and not correlated to one another, it makes our jobs considerably harder. And this is where a SIEM or SIM, depending on who you talk to and how they pronounce it, but a security incident and event management system. These are solutions that are essentially a data store, meaning it's a big server with a bunch of data hard disk space on the back end. And you send all of your logs to a SIM or SIEM and one of the characteristics of a SIM is that it has a query interface. We can run queries, we can analyze the logs, we can create triggers, we can create alerts, more advanced ones support automation where we can create playbooks where we can say, if this log has this value and it happens more than 10 times an hour, I want you to do these next three steps and you can actually set up the system to do that for you automatically. So we can use automation to replicate a lot of the things we've been doing manually. And it takes a lot of work to get to that level where the security can implement that level of automation, but it is doable. We have to have the appropriate logging, the right data sources. We have to be confident in the quality of our data. We need to get that data to a single system, a SIM in this case. And then we need to set up all of our heuristics, our indicators and our alerts. The benefit though is most SIMs come out of the box with a lot of analytics. But again, we've talked about this before, you have to tune those. You can't just plug it in, turn it on and say, all right, it's gonna tell us when something bad happens. It's gonna tell you a lot of things, probably more than you need to know because it's gonna alert on a lot of things 
that it doesn't need to because it doesn't know your network. It needs to be tuned to understand your normal ebb and flow of what's going on. So there's a lot that goes into this and some general concerns that the organization must handle is what types of logs do we have available to us? Do we need all of these logs? What formats are the logs? How do they differ? Well, we have some logs that are in binary format. They're actually stored as ones and zeros in a binary data object. Some are in CSVs, comma separated value text files. Some are in XML format. Some are in JSON or JavaScript object notation, right? So we have all of these different formats that you can't simply just pivot from one to the next. So we need to get these different formatted logs. We need to have a way to forward those logs. How do we get them from their sources to the SIM? And then how are we gonna store them? What level of storage do we have? Most SIMs charge you for the more storage you have. A very, very popular SIM that I highly suggest everybody look into is Splunk. Uh, Splunk is pretty much a de facto SIM used by a lot of organizations for IT and security search capabilities, as well as logging and visualization. You can create custom dashboards, and those are telltale signs of pretty much any SIM that exists out there. The downside to Splunk and a lot of these other SIMs is they are very, very expensive. Uh, in this course, we're going to be using Elk, Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. It's the three names put together, make the system Elk. And Elk is an open source free SIM. So it supports common data formats for security monitoring, and it allows us to store and visualize this data. So that's what we're going to be using in the course. But I highly suggest you take a gander at Splunk, as it's pretty much one that I've seen used in almost every engagement I've been on. So it's worth taking the time to look at that. And the folks over at Splunk have a fantastic introductory course. It will take you about four to seven hours to complete. And I highly recommend taking the time to take that course. It's really good to get an introductory overview of Splunk. So talking about network logs, let's just at a high level talk about some of the more common network logs that exist within our control. Depending on, again, what we have deployed, what we've purchased, and what type of systems we have running, right? These logs are dictated by what systems. Do we have Windows versus Linux? The logs are gonna look different. The type of data that's captured is gonna be different, but they do have the same general flavor or the concepts of what they're collecting are the same. So we have various log types. We can have authentication events. We can get that from the domain controller or end user workstations. We have IP address assignments. So as systems are added to the network, they're given IP addresses, so we could collect DHCP server logs. This would allow us to correlate MAC addresses and IP addresses and host names very rapidly. So DHCP logs are actually used in the SIM and a lot of other security products to do IP enrichment. They help correlate the IP to a host name. So when we're doing a query or we get an alert, instead of just getting you know a general IP, hey, the host at 10.5.5.12 connected to a known malicious website. And then we have to sit there and say, well, what is that IP address? Where is it? What is it doing? Where if we had DHCP logs in our SIM and it was doing that enrichment, that alert would say, oh, this computer host name where this was the last user that used it, right? We have a lot more context to be able to go out and find that machine very quickly. Because DHCP logs are dynamic, if you take a while before you go review that alert, the IP address in the alert might not be assigned to the machine that actually did that malicious traffic. So that's something we need to be aware of. So our DHCP logs help us verify the actual computer host name that did it because the IP is gonna change after a while. We can click DNS records. So as computers in our network are making requests for domain names, we can collect the request and the response. And this is very valuable because many, many, many of the threat intelligence logs or data sources you're gonna get are blacklists, lists of just thousands and thousands of domain names that are known to be bad. So if you're collecting DNS logs, you can quickly corroborate very fast, hey, that domain name from that blacklist was in our log record collection. Oh, and because we have DHCP, we know which machine made that malicious DNS request. So very quickly, using those two log sources, we can pivot very fast to say that machine might be compromised. It's been connecting to a known malicious domain and we can handle that appropriately. We can then also get HTTP logs. And if we're hosting a web server where external users are accessing the web server or even internal users, we can monitor what are the users requesting? What type of HTTP methods are they using? What are their user agents? What was the success or response from the server? Was it a 200 okay? Was a 400 series, the user's requesting something that doesn't exist? Or was it a 500, something's wrong with the server? 
So those logs are very important when we're talking about protecting web applications from denial of service and distributed denial of service attacks. Many times those 500 server errors and the 400 server response codes tell us that users are requesting something that doesn't exist. If they're scanning our server, you know, vulnerability scanning, or they're trying to see if an admin portal or page is left published. So we can detect and respond to those quite quickly if we're collecting those logs. We can also get user HTTP activity from a proxy server. So it's a common practice to deploy a proxy server inside the network. And anytime a user tries to surf the web, all of their web traffic is routed through that proxy before it makes its way to the boundary router and out to the internet. And the benefit of this is, is that proxy server can do TLS decryption and record all of the HTTP requests that the users do. So if this is the first time you've realized that this is occurring in a network you work, please be aware that your Reddit activity and whatever else you do at work is probably being monitored. Um, but using a proxy server, we can collect user activity. And this is really beneficial if there's malware that is using HTTP or HTTPS, we can potentially log these HTTP events that the malware is trying to do. Or if we have users that are insider threats or trying to exfiltrate data or they're accidentally uploading information that they shouldn't have, it's really good to have this uh, user HTTP activity via a proxy server. We have general network monitoring logs. So again, from those network nodes, so going back to flow logs, we could have those Cisco devices generating NetFlow. We can have other vendor routers and switches that are doing IP fix. And there's some vendors that even have their own proprietary flow log format. Either way, we have to deal with all of those logs. All of our network devices can be creating them and we have to acquire that data and get it to the SIM or some other singular storage platform for analysis. We can gather network content so we could do packet capture. Again, remember packet capture is the full take content collection of the communication. So whatever was sent will be recorded and captured. One thing to be aware of when we're doing packet capture is that the majority of our internet communications are now being encrypted and the ability to decrypt them are only dictated if we're using a proxy server or some kind of TLS decryption appliance that we've purchased and set up in our network. If we don't have a proxy server for HTTP activity, we're not doing TLS decryption of our users' web sessions, then doing packet capture is probably not a good idea because we're going to be storing a ton of TLS encrypted packets that we'll never be able to decrypt. So we're just spending a lot of money on collecting that. So if you're gonna do full content packet capture and you don't have a mechanism to decrypt the content you collect, you're gonna to wanna to filter what packets and protocols and applications you're actually gonna collect for full take packet capture. Flow logs are more than sufficient for collecting and monitoring encrypted communications. And one of the benefits going back to flow logs is when you collect those DNS requests, you can correlate the domain names to your flow logs to validate, you know, hey, that's port 80, what were they doing? Well, it's correlated to this known web URL or domain name. So very quickly, we can corroborate that. Yes, that flow log that said port 80 was in fact web traffic, it's going to a known web server. We have our endpoint logs, so a lot of AV antivirus, next gen antivirus, and EDR solutions have their own standalone administrative panels and dashboards. They still allow you to export their logs and event data to a central SIM for overall security operations monitoring and control. So that's another consideration and another point of getting visibility on the end user. We could also get endpoint data from open source tools such as Sysmon. So Sysmon is a Microsoft systems internal project. You can deploy it and what it does is, is it monitors process execution, registry events, and a whole bunch of other stuff. And it logs those as Windows event logs. So we could collect that endpoint visibility from traditional Windows event logs and have those forwarded to our SIM. We can gather network alerts. So this is where we're gonna get alerts from our firewalls, IDSs, IPSs other network monitoring solutions, and we can have those sent to the SIM. The benefit is here, the SIM is doing analytics against all this data. Some of the more modern SIMs that cost more money, you know, they, they advertise you know, artificial intelligence and machine learning and anomaly detection and all that's well and good and provides value to us, but we've got to make sure to get the right data there. And that's first and foremost, the, the big challenge. Regardless of what SIM you use, getting the data there and being familiar with what data you're collecting is of utmost priority. And then last but not least, we have cloud services. If your company uses Amazon, Azure, 
Google Cloud, Oracle Cloud, or even third-party SaaS software products like Office 365 or Google Business and many other providers, those platforms, again, generate their own logs that can be consumed for security operations awareness.